Please join me in welcoming Kim Mai Cutler, technology reporter and columnist for TechCrunch, where she writes about the intersection of technology and culture in the Bay Area. She previously wrote for Bloomberg, VentureBeat, and the Wall Street Journal. Today, she will discuss the insights of history on the Bay Area housing crisis. Please join me in welcoming Kim Mai Cutler. Hi, guys. Um, I'm going to try and speed through this quickly so that we all can start you know, getting to the end of the day. Um, how many of you are renters? How many of you are homeowners? How many of you are in the East Bay? How many of you are in, on the west side of the Bay? OK. Or like, I just called it, I don't know. I mean, I'm at San Francisco in the peninsula. So a little bit about myself. Um, I somehow ended up in this position over the last couple years um, of dissecting and looking into the Bay Area housing crisis. Um, and I got interested in it because, uh, partly, of my, partly because of my family background. I'm third generation to the Bay Area. Uh, my mom came here in 1980, and she was a Vietnamese war refugee who came here on a Greyhound bus because she read about Silicon Valley in a newspaper while she was stationed in Australia. And she brought my entire family over and they moved into a one bedroom in Alameda um, before they ended up moving across to the western half of the bay. And it was kind of a remarkable story, I think, because I think about what she went through today and I'm kind of like, could someone in their early 20s, um, six kind of refugee women come from a war-torn country to the Bay Area and then like buy a house together in their early 20s and work in Silicon Valley? And I just think that that seems like a more and more distant possibility with the way um, the real estate market and, and like income inequality has kind of unfolded here over the last generation. So I started researching it, and um, if you could go to the next slide, click. Um, I ended up writing a bunch of really, really long form articles in TechCrunch of all places about housing. Um, and it was kind of like shocking and weird to people because they were like, why is, this, why is there like a 13,000 word article about housing in a technology blog? Um, can you go to the next slide? Yeah, so back to my story, because I want to give a little bit of Californian history. Um, so after my mom's side of the family left Alameda, they m ended up moving to San Jose and then into Cupertino in the 1980s, which is, as you know, is the headquarters of Apple. And so uh, the house that I, was, I grew up in was built in 1967 by a tract home developer. Um, and I think the price around that time was probably around $20,000. I was looking up ads from the same developer in the early 1970s. Um, there were a lot of really important things that started to unfold um, in the late 60s. If you go to the next slide, um, and the next one. Um, Ronald Reagan became governor of California. Next slide. Uh, we had the human being in San Francisco in the Haight-Ashbury district. Next slide. Um, and echoing you know, this week, we had a lot of racial tension um, and race riots in, in two American cities. And this is following like two years after uh, the Los Angeles riots. Next slide. Uh, and, um, you know, a generation that grew up that was a little, became less enamored of mass industrial, mass consumer culture. Next slide. Um, but the one thing that also happened that year, at least with respect to the Valley, is that this guy moved into a house that was like a mile away from the house where I grew up. Um, Next slide. And this homebrew computer club became, next slide, um, the world's most valuable company. And so we've had this huge um, unfolding. You know, these trends have happened basically all over the world, um, you know, that have reflected, like, income and wealth returns to different types of workers. If you go to the next slide. Um, the tech industry has produced four of the six most valuable corporations by market cap in the world today. They are, and if you get the next click, um, Apple, which makes $2 million in revenue per employee. Next one. Google, which make, made $1.2 million in revenue per employee last year. Next one. Microsoft, which made 780000 Next. And then Facebook, which makes $1.4 million in revenue per employee. Um, and, and, you know, it's, it's just like an incredible amount of change um, in terms of, like, the income that, uh, people of different educational backgrounds can kind of can earn, and that's contributed to like a extraordinary wealth inequality in the Bay Area. Can you do the next slide. 
So even with all these changes um, with re scientific research being commercialized, if I maybe could just do a hand thing so I don't have to do this constantly. But could I get to the next one? Yeah. Semiconductors, the next one. Uh, personal computing and the dot coms. Um, and beyond that, we have a whole host of privately um, owned companies that have yet to go public all around the Bay Area, and all of this extraordinary capital and wealth is um, concentrated here. So you can, next one. Um, so, I mean, there are some very fundamental trends that have kind of unfolded over the last 40 years. Um, Silicon Valley was named Silicon Valley in 1971. Um, and uh, venture capital started to proliferate in the 1980s when um, pensions were allowed to invest in them for the first time. Um, but something else also started happening in the 70s in California as well, and that was significant changes to our land use policy and our approach to building housing and building cities. Um, and so one's going in one direction and is going like super, super fast, and the other one is getting more and more bureaucratic. And so they're conflicting with each other. And so if you look at the barrier, um, Despite all of this incredible wealth, the built environment remains largely the same. If you could do the next one. Um, this is a home built by a progressive real estate developer named Joseph Eichler um, in 1950s uh, in Palo Alto. And if you look at the pricing on this ad, um, this is a house that cost $9,400. And the median income in the Bay at that time was $6,600. So if you could kind of imagine that, like if you came to the Bay 60 years ago, um, a house would cost 1.5 times your annual income. And because of veterans programs, you could get it with $300 down. Um, and Eichler is a very notable developer. If you could go to the next slide. Or t well, today, today an Eichler in Palo Alto is more than $2 million, and it's become this luxury item that has like coffee table books. And oh, there's someone dancing in the back. What are you dancing in the back for? I'm a millionaire because of the Oh, great. Congratulations. That's amazing. Work it out. Yeah. Um, so it's become this luxury item. There's like documentaries about them. It's pretty crazy. Next one. Um, but the kind of irony of this whole thing is like um, Joseph Eichler is the developer who inspired Steve Jobs to make uh, well-designed affordable products for the masses. And he said Eichler, he said in his autobiography, or sorry, biography to Walter, Walter Isaacson, Eichler did a great thing. His houses were smart and cheap and good. They brought clean design and simple taste to lower income people. And not only that, he was also a developer that um, in a time of a lot of racial discrimination in housing markets was willing to sell to uh, minorities in the Silicon Valley Peninsula. So he would actually sell homes to African Americans and to Asian Americans um, despite protest of other potential buyers. Next slide. So in the 70s, because of these two trends, California home prices started to deviate from the rest of the United States. So if you look at, in 1970, housing was probably only like 30, like housing was, housing in California is pretty much the same price as housing in the rest of America up until around 1970. And then it just started to split. And today the median home price of a Californian property is about two and a half times what it costs in the rest of the United States. So you can next slide. And these, this is a measure called a price to income ratio. And so remember when I said, if you bought a house in Palo Alto in 1950, um, you know, it was 1.5 times your annual income. Today in the Bay Area, it's around nine to 10 times your annual income. And in the late 70s, it was about four times your annual income. So now houses are selling for multiples of around, you know, nine, 10, 11 times people's median an annual income in the area. So if you could do the next slide. Um, historically, this growth has generally been good. Um, this is a slide from a study done by an economics professor named Raj Chetty, who is now at Stanford University. And his body of work is entirely about neighborhoods and how neighborhoods condition um, what your um, outcomes in terms of income and quality of living and all this other stuff and education, uh, how they unfold over your lifetime. And what he found in analyzing 40 million income records across the United States, I think over like 20 years, and this is a slide from the Wall Street Journal, if you were born into the lowest income quintile of either San Jose or San Francisco, you had the highest chance of getting out of that lowest income, in in income quintile than compared to anywhere else in the rest of the United States. So looking backwards, this amount of growth um, has generally been good, but if you could go to the next slide, um, 
and I'm sure this is in line with a lot of the Georgia's kind of thinking you've seen over the last day, um, in the last economic cycle, uh, poverty rates have also gone up along with the economic growth here. And, and you know, a main transfer mechanism of that, of course, is the cost of housing. So if like, once you factor in the cost of housing in the state of California, um, the poverty rate ends up being closer to something like almost a quarter. Um, so if you can next slide. And, and one thing that, you know, coming from, as someone who speaks a lot to the technology industry, like something that the industry has never been able to reconcile with itself is its range and income range of job creation. And so this is a chart from a planning document, because I like, I really like reading planning documents, um, of, of job creation by <laughs> area median income over the last 20, 25 years almost in San Francisco. And, you, and these different bars represent um, different income bands. Um, so you know, the 150 plus is 150% of area median income. And the red line would be zero to 50% of area median income. And you can see the, like, the two bands of jobs that we're creating the most of, um, we're creating the most zero to 50% of area median income jobs, which are like very low income jobs. And then after that, we're creating a lot of jobs that are at the 120 to 150% of area median income range. So we have a two-sided job market. And we're producing many more low-wage jobs than we are producing higher-wage jobs. Next slide. And, and if you're a service worker today in Silicon Valley, it's like pretty crazy. Like I can't even think about the math um, because if you look at median rents um, and you look at what people are being paid for various positions, it's like you need to work like 100 hours a week or 150 hours a week just to afford the average asking rent. So next slide. So this is a quote from Roberta Hernandez, who is a mission activist who um, was behind the mission moratorium. And you know, like, there's a lot of different solutions being discussed here, but like, there's some real, these are real situations that people are speaking on behalf of. And he was speaking about um, a family that was displaced from San, San Francisco's mission district to Pittsburgh or Antioch. And he was saying they have to get up at 3 or 4 a.m. in the morning to get to BART. Then they jump on a mini bus. They drop off their kids at school. Then they jump on another bus to get to work. And they're spending $389 a month on BART and Muni, and they're making $12 an hour. Um, and if you go to the next slide. Um, and then earlier this year, a bunch of Palo Alto school teachers went to Palo Alto, um, the, the, the school board, and they were like, you know, they're actually paid for teachers. They're paid actually really quite well. They're making like in the 9,500 plus range, but Palo Alto's median home price is like more than 2 million. And there was also an 893 square foot bungalow that sold for $9.5 million last week. So um, if you're a teacher, you're kind of screwed. And so she was talking about commuting two hours each way just to get to, to work. Um, next slide. And I think the transit is a huge component of discussing, this is like another wonky chart from Ross Chetty. Um, transit is actually really, really important for um, socioeconomic mobility. Um, and what he found in his study was that your tran the transit time of the parent um, was pretty much, it's one of the top one or two factors in determining a child's chances of getting out of the lowest income quintile to the highest one. Um, so it's the top factor. So by, you know, exposing people to longer and longer commutes, you're taking, like, child care time away, you're taking care, you're taking away really important child development time, um, which just is not very good for um, social mobility. So... And then there's this generational issue, which is the one that um, the guy in the back was dancing about, which is how much people are spending as a percentage of their income on housing. So if, you're, if you were born in 1960, you might start spending a higher percentage of your income on housing, and then it like drops over your lifetime. But as land has gotten more and more expensive, um, and rents have gotten higher and higher as a result of that, today if you're born in 1950, you're probably, sorry, 1990, you're spending like 50% or more on housing of your income. And that's probably going to trace for the rest of your life as well. So if you go to the next slide. Um, next slide. So the question is like, how did it happen and what are the policies that sort of enabled this to happen? Next slide. Um, California is kind of a weird place. There's, there's a great guy who um, wrote a book called California Crack Up, which is a book about... Um, 
how to reform government here. His name is Joe Matthews, and he wrote a column a few months ago, and he said the problem with California is not that it has too large a government, it's that it has too many small and stupid governments. So California has 6,000 6, governments, and it has 101 cities in the Bay Area across nine counties. Um, and it has very weak regional organizations that can kind of compel different cities to do different things. So we get to the next slide. Um, and if you compare that with other older cities that were able to combine and form um, 100 years earlier, I mean, they can ha just have much more coherent plans around housing and transit. So New York City, for example, um, combined all five boroughs into one city in 1898, and so they have one government over around 8 million people um, and then 22 million people regionally, while we have one, uh, 101 governments for 7.7 .7 million people. Um, so that enables them to just really, really manage and organize transit more coherently than we can. Next slide. And, and regional fragmentation is really important, and I'll give you a lot of examples of this in a second. Um, there's a couple, you know, there's the first issue, which is all these cities are just making decisions that are in their own constituency's interests and not considering their impact on others. And then the other thing that um, what wealthy neighborhoods do uh, is they tend to like down zone and protect the single family home and then approve a lot of office space, uh, which puts the burden and the housing burden and affordability burden on other communities, which is kind of what's unfolding here in the Bay Area. And then the last part is that it just makes it really hard to have like a coherent like, like business or uh, corporate taxation policy. So cities end up competing against each other and lowering their business taxes in a race to the bottom, which makes it really hard to manage employer impacts in the Bay Area as well. Next slide. So, I mean, there's a lot of theories as to why uh, cities stopped combining into each other a century ago, and I think, like, one of the main theories is that it was um, the advent of the automobile and zoning. So, like, in the 19th century, as a city grew up, um, the surrounding communities around it um, would end up with so much population overflow and then no ability to control it that they would just kind of give up and be absorbed into the main municipal body, which is still what happens in, in states like Texas. But once the car existed, and that was spreading different kinds of uses and different types of employment everywhere, and then zoning was created 100 years ago, cities now had this legal tool that they could use to kind of implicitly control who could join them. And once they had that, they didn't need to be annexed because they could control who was benefiting from their services and who was not. So, next slide. And um, one other uh, complicating factor in the state of California is we have, um, you know, direct democracy. And this is Hiram Johnson. He was a progressive governor 100 years ago, and his goal um, in being elected, you know, from San Francisco was to control the power of railroads and corporations over the state government. And his solution to that was to create the initi ballot initiative, the referendum, and the recall. Um, initiatives, um, which we all know, there will be, I think there will be 39 of them on the ballot in San Francisco in November, plus 17 on the state level. Yeah, more voting. Um, <laughs> they weren't really used until the 1970s, and they became really, really... Um, they proliferated, and oftentimes they're used as a threat against, against or for development. Um, but it's also really complicated governance because, you know, you can kind of just write anything into the code of the California Constitution really easily. So unlike America's Constitution, the California Constitution has been amended 521 times in the last 100 years. So next slide. Um, so this creates a really kind of crazy situation. We have, we've got direct democracy, we've got really fragmented government, um, and this is kind of another wonky chart. It basically just shows an urban distribution of population from the urban kind of core out to the ex-urban periphery. So like you could imagine that this would be like San Francisco or Oakland, and this would be like Menlo Park or like, I don't know, Orinda or something, and then here would be like, you know, what? Or, yeah, or like Stockton or something. Or, like, so you have these like very affluent suburbs that have just like down zoned and like frozen themselves in time. And what that means for population growth is population growth ends up coming up over here. And that puts pressure on the, uh, on the housing stock in the city, which causes gentrification. And then you have housing pressure over here, which creates like 
really long mega commuting for people, f you know, from really, really far out communities. And then you end up with um, regional out migration as people end up deciding to move to places like Portland or um, Denver or whatever. Um, so it's a really complicated impacts from suburban downzoning. So as an example of that, if you go to the next slide, oh, forward. Yeah, progressive. Yeah, next one. Um, so that's an example. You end up pushing development pressure out to, yeah, like out really out far, Palm Springs, wherever. Um, and then you end up eroding and kind of consuming land in the environment. And then, after, next slide. And then um, pressure in the urban core, as we all know, in San Francisco and Oakland. Next slide. And then, you know, causing other cities to have housing, ha housing bubbles as well. So next slide. Um, and I think this like, dynamic is kind of super important from a historical perspective because it's basically repeating things that happened 80 years ago kind of in like new and insidious ways. So I mean, I'm sure a lot of people in this room you know, know about redlining and how um, in the midst of the Great Depression when we were trying to jumpstart housing markets um, and FDR's administration created the FHA, um, the Federal Housing Administration, to kind of decide how to kickstart lending and capital to housing markets. Um, it was a very institutionally racist uh, system that backed capital to primarily white neighborhoods and then did not back it to uh, neighborhoods uh, with lots of communities of color. Um, and so these are the redlining maps of San Francisco and Oakland, and you can see it's a lot of the eastern neighborhoods. And if you look at today, like this is a map from UC Berkeley's, uh, I can't remember, is it Miriam Zook, who was cataloging displacement risk of tenants. And so you can see it's basically the same neighborhood. So these neighborhoods that were starved of capital 80 years ago are now at most at risk of displacement because all these other richer and more priced in neighborhoods have basically decided not to make room. And in, in the practice of not making room, they're implicitly saying that these other neighborhoods need to take uh, the burden and the economic pressure. Um, so if you go, next slide. So the region is really, really tied together. Next slide. Um, Palo Alto, you know, even though it created Silicon Valley uh, in the mid to late 1970s, it decided we're going to downzone and we're going to protect the primacy of the single family home. And it did that, you know, in a number of ways. There were certain projects that were killed because they would institute like a one house per 10 acre rule or some ridiculous stuff like that. Um, you know, a, a few years ago, voters actually killed, decided to kill uh, a senior affordable housing development by ballot initiative. And two weeks ago, it was approved for 16 single family homes, which are probably going to sell for at least, you know, two, three million dollars each. <laughs> And when they announced it that day, the same day, one of the other newspapers in Palo Alto had a front cover story about the opening of a different senior housing project in which people had, like senior citizens, had literally stayed up all night in line to like get into the lottery for that building. So, you know, they, they've decided to do this and they've decided to maintain a really, really suburban form um, despite the fact that they have three jobs for every housing uh, develop, through housing unit. So next slide. And, and it's pretty sad, there was a story in the New Republic last December about a woman who did own a home and bought a home, I think, in the 1970s in Palo Alto. And her partner ended up getting really, really sick and having huge, giant medical expenses. And that basically caused them to fall behind on their uh, mortgage payments. And she ended up homeless. And this whole story chronicles them like driving around in an RV, and it's really, really awful. Um, but there was one quote in there that was like particularly delicious and dark. Um, there's a woman in that story uh, who was working, I think, at a nonprofit, like working with a lot of. Um, it was like a woman's shelter, and she went to a public meeting where people were trying to oppose that shelter. And this woman came up to her, and she was like you know, her lips were quivering and she was physically shaking from how angry she was. She was like, you come back to me 20 years from now, once you've sunk more than a million dollars into an asset like a house and you tell me that you're willing to take a risk like this. Um, so it's like all these, you have all these ripple effects from all these different like tacit decisions that different communities are making about what is allowed or what is not allowed in their, in, in their neighborhoods. Next slide. And an effect of that, you know, is that the tech industry, which was once 
born in Palo Alto is now coming here. Um, and you can see all these deals in the last couple of weeks, like Goldman Sachs, I think, wait, who, who bought the Magnum building or the green building? Do you, there was like, there's that like kind of iconic greenish lime, lime colored building on, but like there, there's a lot of deals that are happening now effectively because the western half of the bay up and down the peninsula from San Francisco, San Jose has decided not really to make space. And so, um, you know, in 1986, San Francisco voters passed Prop M, which limits the amount of office space there. So there's not a lot of office space, period. Um, so Uber has decided to open office here, and that's going to have impacts on the community here. Um, you know, because of affordable housing fee rules here, the city got like $1 million in affordable housing fees. It costs around $500,000 to construct a new housing unit here, and it doesn't matter whether that's market rate or affordable, it's the same cost. Um, and then there's gonna be probably like displacement impacts, as I'm sure you've seen in a lot of community meetings. The median tenant income here is $30,000, and then almost half of the tenants here are black. So, you know, these impacts go back and forth. They're like really crazy. And, the, and again, this is the town where I grew up. Um, you know, uh, Cupertino voters approved uh, Apple's second campus, uh, or Apple Campus 2, which is that giant spaceship thing. And it will eventually house 14,000 workers there, up from the 4,000 workers that were there before. And across the street, um, a really old failed mall um, came up for purchase about a year and a half ago. And a single developer bought all 50 acres of it. Um, and I was kind of trying to figure out what they were going to, you know, what they were doing and what they, why they planned to do it the way they planned to do it. But what they proposed to the Cupertino community was... Um, a $3 billion rooftop park with offices for 8,000 jobs and 800 housing units. And I was like, that's crazy. Like, why would you, why would you, why would the city, why would the city approve, you know, 14,000 more workers and then another site for 8,000 more jobs and only 800 housing units? And I was talking to the developer and he said, well, Cupertino's general plan is so specific that it almost pretty much dictates how much you know, housing, how, many, how much residential square footage an individual project can have. And like by them even proposing 800 units, they were exhausting the entire residential allotment for like the next decade. And not only that, 10 years earlier, Cupertino voters had killed condos on this particular parcel of land. So this developer didn't want to take that risk. And then if you went and read kind of the nimbyism against this project, um, Cupertino voters actually tried to put a ballot initiative this November to kill this project and basically make sure it was totally retail and had, be, had essentially no, no office, no housing whatsoever. And I was like, what's going on there? Next slide. Why is there no housing? They wanted to protect access to their schools. They were like, we don't want to approve more, we don't want to approve more residents in this town because their kids are going to compete with our kids in the schools and they're going to overcrowd the schools. Um, so, oh, you like this drawing, Sonia? It's pretty much the best drawing. So they were trying to like make this small project seem really evil and terrible, so they passed this slide around. So, um, so this fragmentation kind of spreads up and down literally every level of, of the, the Bay Area. So you have planning fragmentation, and then you have transit fragmentation. And so these are all the different systems that we have in the Bay Area. There's no transit system with more than like 50% market share. If you compare that to New York, MTA has 94% market share. They have 800 miles of track. We have 100 miles of track, and it's, as you know, deeply, badly outdated. Next slide. Okay, this, I already, well, we'll just go to the next one. Um, and so what that's, that's caused is this situation where people are trying to do like really crappy workarounds. And um, the shuttle program is one example of that. Um, and the reason that, part of the reason that they exist is like these cities down in the South Bay, they don't really approve development near transit stops. They approve them like a mile or a couple miles off. And so you end up with the last mile problem. And so these tech companies do this workaround with the shuttles. And I thought this was kind of an interesting contrast because um, the original psychedelic magic bus was actually originally purchased in Atherton and then came north to San Francisco. So like, um, both buses actually came from the Silicon Valley Peninsula, but no one really knows that. Um, next slide. And then the huge kind of elephant in the room that some people have alluded to is our unique taxation system. So in the 70s, after 
California cities started approving all kinds of growth controls, and there was stagflation. Housing prices went sort of crazy. Um, and California voters responded by capping their property taxes, and that basically cut property tax revenue by more than 50% in a single year in 1978 when, Cal when Jerry Brown was governor the first time. And then they also passed laws requiring new supermajorities for new taxes and bonds. And this is like fundamentally changed the entire financial structure of the state of California. Next slide. Um, because property tax is a really stable form of revenue. It is very predictable. Most states use it to fund schools and fire and police. Um, and what has happened instead in the state of California is we have changed our entire financial structure to be more dependent on both sales tax, which is regressive, and generally disproportionately hurts the poor, and then personal income, which is progressive, and, and progressive is good in a time of rising income inequality, but it's also incredibly volatile. So if you look at California's state budget, two-thirds of the state budget is personal income taxation, and then half of that is generated by the top 1% of earners in the state of California. So a huge, like a third of our budget is basically dependent on like capital, you know, like on the earnings of the top 1% whose earnings come from capital gains and stocks. And what that means is our budget is incredibly volatile and we can't really plan anything very well because our budget can swing up or down by tens of billions of dollars in a single year, depending on whether the stock market crashes or not. Next slide. So you can go to the next one, actually. Um, and then not only that, like the change in property taxation really kind of messed up. You're really excited. <laughs> um, messed up our... our um, our kind of land use system. So when you lower property taxes, what you're basically doing is you're lowering it for incumbents, but the lower property taxes get capitalized into higher property values later on. So right after Proposition 13, a Berkeley professor, a real estate professor, looked at all the impacts and housing prices in Northern California and he found that every dollar that Prop 13 reduced property taxes increased their value by $7. So basically what you're doing is you're cutting it's, it is a generational transfer of wealth, essentially. Um, and the expectation of very low and cap property taxes actually makes California housing incredibly attractive to outside global investment capital um, because there's like a predictable, there's a predictable kind of um, cost base that you're gonna have. And it incentivizes all kinds of things like land banking. So in the development cycle, when the development cycle turns, and a landowner doesn't feel like they're going to get an adequate price. There's no disincentive to, for them to just sit on that land and wait until the next cycle. Whereas under a different system, if property tax is adjusted, they might feel more inclined to sell the land, um, and then it would get, they would get penalized for sitting on it and not developing it into something useful. So next slide. So this is kind of another wonky chart of um, how this generational transfer is working. So like housing purchased after 99 is supporting almost 80% of Santa Clara County's property tax assessments. Um, so, you know, like the newcomers, as despised as they are, are really supporting a lot of the tax base for police, fire, and schools for Californian cities and the state. So if you the next slide. And then the more important thing that it did was that um, property taxation from housing is capped and so low that it is very unattractive compared to other uses of land for city and municipal governments. And so um, two weeks ago, Brisbane, um, which is a 4,000 person suburb, 15 minutes south of San Francisco, they have a 660 acre parcel um, that could be redeveloped. 660 acres, 15 minutes south of San Francisco. So it could be a really attractive place for housing, but the city council recommended no housing. And if you looked at the financial numbers, that city was gonna make four times the net tax revenue back if it was just hotel and office than if it was housing. So housing, most types of housing development is revenue negative for cities, unless it's above a certain density. Um, and that's kind of part of the issue. Like it's not just the nimbyism, it's also that the last generation of Californians basically baked it into the California Constitution through ballot initiative that resident, most kinds of residential would be tax revenue negative for cities. So it's, it's, it's like baked into the entire tax, state tax code. Next slide. And so that, that has kind of changed city finance like 
fundamentally in the state of California. In, 19, in 1977, you know, cities, California cities were getting maybe a quarter of their revenue from charges and fees, and now they're probably getting close to, to 40% or higher. And fees generally, again, like fees for services, that generally is regressive. Next. And it's had huge impacts on schools because property tax is the main form of revenue for schools. So, you know, we fall into the bottom like 15 and I think per pupil spending in the United States. And to make up for that, lots of communities have turned to private fundraising. And so they're raising private funds outside of the system. Um, and then it also affected pensions as well because public workers could now go and negotiate with the state instead of the cities for um, pension benefits. So that's also contributed to a situation where we have enormous uh, pension liabilities because the negotiations are happening in a less transparent um, sense that's less accountable to um, you know, city, city voters. So California has a pretty unusual land use regime. If you do the next slide. Um, this is a picture of Jerry Brown and Pat Brown. Pat Brown um, was governor in the 1960s in the state of California. When he was governor, California was a high tax, high service, and high growth state. Um, it was adding 500,000 Californians per year, or about one Californian a minute. Um, and you know, it was very, it was a very ambitious time. Like lots of, uh, you know, flatlands were being turned into suburbs. Uh, Pat Brown. Um, commissioned uh, the master plan for higher education, which said that you know, our university system, the UCs, CSUs, and community colleges would be free, um, for tuition free. Um, but he was thrown out of office and voted out of office in 1966 when Ronald Reagan won. And then by the time that Jerry Brown became governor of California, the entire kind of atmosphere of the state had changed. It was once a high growth state, and by the time Jerry Brown became governor for the first time, it was a very slow growth state. And Californians became really, really acutely aware of all the like, downsides of the suburban growth model and of the costs of the sprawl, the traffic, the congestion, the environmental costs um, after the 1973 oil crisis. So he inherited just a completely different state than the one that his father had governed. Um, and around that time, is the 1970s is when all the growth controls came into existence, or a lot of them started to come into existence, as people started to be aware of you know, certain good things, like wanting to preserve the environment, but a lot of other things. So you know, in 1972, Petaluma was the first Northern California city to institute a land use control by limiting um, growth to only 500 houses per year. And then lots of other cities copied them across the state. And so this, these are mentions of growth management and housing prices and exclusionary zoning in Google book search. Um, so I, I think I, I guess I can talk, I mean, yeah, there were a bunch of things that happened. There were like housing limits and then the California Supreme Court was really anti-growth. So they ruled in 1975 that cities did not have to compensate landowners if they downzoned their land. And that's um, partly when a lot of the downzonings happened because cities realized they didn't have to pay pay landers if they cut the heights and then reduce the financial value of their land. So that's when like Palo Alto and, and Haight-Ashbury and other San Francisco neighborhoods st started downzoning. Um, so there's a lot of different reasons why. Um, you know, housing, so the 1970s were a period of time when housing started to split um, from its historical behavior. From the 1940s to the 1970s, housing mostly rose at the cost, uh, sorry, at the pace of inflation. And this was because there was lots of cheap, available, developable land that could be turned over into suburban home tracks. Um, but by the 1970s, that housing sort of ran out. Sorry, that land ran out. Um, and housing in general shifted from being perceived as a consumable good to an investable asset. Next slide. And then the environmental movement also happened there, and people wanted to preserve open space. So a lot of the open space roles originate from that time. And then um, at the same time, in, you know, in 1968, we finally passed some nationwide laws to ban, ban racial discrimination in housing markets. Um, we banned them one week after um, the, the assassination of Martin Luther King. And then literally after the decade after that, all of this like controlled zoning stuff started showing up. And like, you know, I, I, I mean, I can go to the next slide. So here's an example. Um, in Los Altos Hills, they have a house, they have a rule, one, ac one house per one acre. That, that is how they control the value of their real estate. Um, and 
next slide. A Latino um, affordable housing group named La Raza tried to sue to build uh, a multifamily development in that community. And it made it all the way to the California Supreme Court. And basically, the California Supreme Court said this wasn't, you know, this one house per one acre rule but wasn't, um, wasn't necessarily, wasn't discriminatory. And it didn't, you know, it's, they said it does not substantially impair any important interest of the poor. And so that's how all these like affluent suburban communities around the California, they started controlling with single family home zoning, houses per acre rules, all sorts of things that prevented the development of multifamily housing. And that's in part why there's so much pressure on the urban core to have this type of more affordable multifamily housing stock historically. So with all of those rules that started emerging in the 1970s, um, our housing production went way down over the last you know, 50, 40, 50 years, both multifamily and single family production. And um, as we've added tons of jobs with the tech boom, um, that's created obviously huge housing, you know, real estate pressures, price pressures. So in the last cycle, we added 105,000 more employed residents, but only 8,200 more units. So like a 10 to one ratio. And then on top of that, San Francisco is kind of unique in the sense that we actually only like 10% of our housing stock is actually market rate. Um, most of it, you know, a third of it is owner occupied, almost half of it is rent controlled. We have a lot of BMR housing. So really you're only talking about 30 to 40,000 units that get really, really impacted, you know, from a price signaling perspective um, from an influx in new population. So like when you add 100,000 new residents and most of these other kind of units have some type of protection around them, I mean, it really smacks into the price of those 30 to 40,000 market rate units. So there are like lots of questions and I, I would love to take some after this. Um, there's a lot of different causes to the situation that we're in. You know, is it wealth inequality? Is it restrictive land use policies? Is it inflows of you know, global or external investment capital? Is it inadequate public funding for low income housing and rental subsidies? And it's, and it's all of the above. And just like no one says there's no single bullet, there's like no single reason for this issue. Um, and there are lots of ways that we need to figure out, probably retooling how we finance all this stuff. We need to have pretty serious conversations about how we're gonna finance the next generation of Californians, um, and whether that's gonna, you know, how much should come from the companies that are here, how much should come from the people who are, you know, you know from people's income taxes. Should we change property and land taxes um, because they've so severely distorted our financing system over the last um, generation? And, you know, there's a lot of different solutions, if you do the next slide. I think that we need a stronger regional government that can coordinate policy. It's really, really sad to watch all of these tacit decisions being made that are really destructive. Like, earlier this week, I read that Atherton wanted to sue to stop Caltrain electrification, which would allow Caltrain to add more capacity. And this is, like, one of the most wealthy communities in the entire country, and they want to stop the public sort of transit system from having better capacity, which in turn leads to all these like shitty transit solutions. Um, and we probably need, we need a, need a lot more regional coordination on affordable housing. Um, it's difficult to watch all these different cities try to kind of do it on their own. Like I know that the Santa Clara County has a $950 million bond this November. I, I don't remember, does Alameda County have one this fall? Does anyone know? Okay. What? 580 million, okay. San Francisco just passed one last year for 310 million. Um, so all, all these communities are trying to do it on their own with debt fundraising. Um, and then we do need some kind of, I, I think we, with a regional government, we, still, we also need like a stronger, more coherent regional tax policy. Because um, one of the issues that makes it difficult for cities in the South Bay and San Francisco to plan you know, around different impacts of different companies is that there's literally one giant multi-billion dollar cor corporation per one suburb. So you end up with a situation where like Cupertino's budget is like 20 or 30% dependent on Apple, which is really bad from a financial diversification perspective because they're all dependent on one company. Um, and that, that company could go under or do very well. Um, but you know, if there was some way to share some of that impact across the region, like Google, Apple, um, um, Facebook, instead of having their taxes like go to one suburb and having that suburb not be diversified, um, I, I think that we need to have that discussion. And then we're in the process of um, adding more granny 
unit legislation or accessory dwelling le unit legislation. This is one kind of like piecemeal solution, which is just streamlining legislation for backyard units. And then I think you know we need to have we need to start having a major transit discussion as well. Bart will be asking for I think three billion dollars in November, right? They will be having a major transit bond of some sort. Um, but our transit is really really behind and really really fragmented. And then we need stronger tenant rights and that like they're strong tenant they're relatively there's strong tenant rights in San Francisco, strong but less strong tenant rights in Oakland, and then basically none in the peninsula. There's basically no power that tenants have in the situation that there is down there. And there are a couple, um, there were like, there's a giant uh, housing development that's being destroyed in San Jose that's gonna displace a lot of people. Um, and then I, I definitely think, I wanna start this discussion. I don't know about you, I'm, I've, the more I've looked into it, I'm like, this is, this is absolutely insane and how messed up it makes all the land use and development um, situations here. And like, I don't know what that would look like. I know that the start is talking about um, repealing the benefit from commercial and office properties. But I, I mean, I think ultimately, you know, maybe it should only be for like primary residences or primary homeowner residences. I think that we need to figure out a way to, to you know, to have a stronger... Um, property tax base for all these cities and take all of these like kind of distorted incentive effects from the land use process that Prop 13 creates. And then for the last part, I know that everything seems really impossible, but I just want to remind people of extraordinary things that have happened in the history of cities and housing from different perspectives. Um, uh, in 1811, Manhattan was just built down to here. Um, and the city had the foresight to say we're going to have a functional grid structure all the way up the island even though no one lives there right now or hardly anyone lives there right now and it took immense public will to make that happen but that grid basically has enabled um, Manhattan to be what it is today and then the annexation creating a regional government you know five boroughs into one regional government and then the last another example that I want to give is I just want to point to Vienna which has um, they came out of the First World War and they had massive housing shortages, but they did develop the collective public will to create a massive social housing program. And today, a quarter of Vienna's housing is public, 42% overall is either public or social. <clears throat> and that was a major land acquisition program. So like, cities in the past have done really crazy things with sufficient political will. It's just a matter of educating people enough to do it and then organizing. So that, I think that's my last slide. Is that it? Okay. Do you guys have questions or anything? Definitely take questions. Um, yeah. If when people ask their questions, if you can really project, and then if you can reiterate, just so the camera can hear it, and okay. uh, we'll start. Sure. Does anyone have questions? <laughs> None. That's a lot to process. It is a lot to process. Yeah. Were you come on my walking tour of social movement history in San Francisco and make it a better walk? Wait, what? Would you come on my walking tour of social movement history in San Francisco and totally. so make it a better walk? Okay. All right. Cool. Yes. Disagreements are too, totally cool, too, in the back. Um, I'm also in San Francisco. I live in Oslo, Canada. Your presentation, I said, well, how do you survive? Everybody comes in. I don't I don't think about it as high taxation I think about it as uh, what are the levers and are the levers in the right places um, so we do I mean like company so people are obviously willing so for, with the rent part like a lot of rent is actually a lot of housing stock in both San Francisco and Oakland is actually rent controlled. So like the sticker prices are different than what people may actually pay. On the taxation part, um, you know, we have some of the, we actually on a state by state basis have lower property taxes compared to, we probably have in the bottom 10 to 15 property, effective property tax rates compared to other states in the US. But we have the high sales taxes and the most progressive income taxes. Um, Clearly, like a lot of people and companies that come here are willing to pay an enormous premium to be here. It's just that a lot of that premium is absorbed into land rents and housing costs. And so if there's a way to figure out how to transfer some of that to public interest um, and public need while also kind of protecting like, um, you know, you know, lower income tenants and middle class like 
like the middle class here. Um, I mean, I think that's a discussion that's worth having in the back. It sounds like you think that the Prop 13, the first step is to work on the commercial. Yeah. Uh, I'm wondering what you think about trying to win over the Jarvis Gann people. They, they must realize something's wrong. I've never talked to them, so I have no idea what their deal is. Because, uh, you know, I think they must realize something's uh, not right with what they're doing. And I'm wondering if they could be, it'd be a lot easier if you could win them over to making some sensible and reasonable improvement. Yeah. Then it could be, you know, it could be uh, slammed up, I think. Yeah. But I don't think we're trying that. I mean, it's worth it. What is it? I don't know. Has anyone talked to them? Has anyone talked? Because I've never talked to them before, so I don't know their deal. I've met one a lobbyist in Sacramento, and I don't think they're anybody. Um, this, they know there's something wrong, and it's manifested by a like total siege mentality. They wait. They are protect Prop 13. Prop 13 is the most important thing. We must protect Prop 13. Like they're really siege. They've they the castle. Yeah. They've yeah. Uh, built up the There's no talking yeah. with no one. Also, aren't you worried? So if they repeal Prop 13 for commercial, won't yeah, that fuck up the fiscalization of land use? It'll make it even worse. Yeah. But I mean, like that's the most feasible first thing, right? Oh, Tim, did you have a question? Or uh, do you see the prospect of the federal government with the reverse course and start to take action, the uh, obligation building option? Um, the conversations that I have had at that level, so. Congress has basically been non-functional for the last several terms, so you can't get anything through there, essentially. I mean, who knows, it might change in November, but I mean, that's been, you know, I, I, my understanding is the Obama White House did try to cap the mortgage interest deduction about five years ago, and it didn't work. Um, and I, I think the mortgage interest deduction is actually a really important thing, because it, California takes about 20% of its value, and the region of the country that has the highest homeowner tax deductions is, is here, it's the Bay Area and it's Oakland and the San Jose area, and because of the supply, so the supply restrictions and the tax deductions actually interact in a really interesting way in that the tax deductions don't actually increase the home ownership rate here, they just get capitalized into the land values. Um, so that, I mean, that they, you know, the Obama administration has had that idea, they just don't know how to get it through. The other um, issue is that a lot, of the, a lot of the stuff is happening at the very, very local level, so, it's unclear how much power the federal government has on the like local kind of zoning issue level other than like you know they've been promoting some papers and stuff and some certain ideas but I don't I haven't seen I don't know what the effective policy lever for them would be except through the states yeah uh, just to say, taking a totality of what you say and what you're basically indicating is that a speculation tax of some form in terms of measuring the inequity of these different effects of these levers could be could, uh, could be approximated so that we could raise taxes on speculation of the land and reduce some of the, the externalities that have been baked into the system. Yeah, I'm I think I I think it's one of the issue it's really hard to distinguish what like, how would you, what would be the measurement that you would use to distinguish speculative behavior from, like, genu gen genuine behavior? I, th I think that's one of the issues that a lot of the, like, the, one of the issues, for example, that the city, like, when, the, when you talk to the city, like, why don't you guys tax vacant housing that is held as an investment by, you know, like, investors from somewhere else? And then there's this measurement issue of how you would measure and track that. And then, you know, how would you distinguish that from, quote unquote, legitimate home buying and property buying behavior? And like, I, that's, that's, I think it's a measurement, like, how much do you take away the biases and the policies overall that cause land to be worth more than it would otherwise be across the board versus measuring and distinguishing what constitutes like genuine, gen, whatever genuine behavior is from speculative behavior. Yeah. Well, uh, there's a Georgia's group, Land Bay Tax Advocates, in um, Melbourne, Australia. And to approximate that, they do things like measure water use or yeah. other utilities. And that's a way to, it's imperfect, but it's a way to approximate 
you know, figuring out whether it's something is actually being used at all, but as to you know, getting granular about how much it's used and whether that's the highest and best use, that's really difficult. So in some ways that's kind of the uh, simplicity of something like land value tax if you're able to get past all of the really complex political hurdles is that you don't necessarily have to calculate that, you let the market calculate that and then that's, you know, uh, that just factors into how much you pay to own the land. I heard about uh, a proposal in Vancouver recently. I can't remember the exact details. I might not remember the exact details, but I think it might they might have tried to address the problem by proposing a tax on uh, all the on all the properties, uh, and then you get a an income a payroll tax credit if you have a, a primary residence in the city. So they yeah. uh, basically, if you own the property. Um, Everybody gets the tax, and then um, that is applied to all properties. And then you just get, they just figure it out by saying, well, if you have your, your primary residence here, then we're going to give you the money back to the payroll. Yeah. Did you guys have any feedback on the, I put a lot, I put a lot of stuff in this presentation, so if you had any thoughts on it or comments on it before we finish. Right, it makes my brain hurt. <laughs> yeah, in the back. I'll say, I, I was a little shocked. You seem to say that uh, we need more centralized power, and often you hear that uh, for a lot of situations, the solution is to diffuse uh, planning and power, and direct democracy is the solution. You seem to be saying part of the problem was with the fact that we have power. Yeah, I mean. I mean, power in terms of land use and community planning works in a lot of very unpredictable ways. And, like, I can definitely see the argument that, like, um, you know, in a lot of the communities that are feeling a lot of pressure from what's happening right now, um, you know, there are, there's differences between increasing housing stock from a regional perspective and from increasing it on a block by block or neighborhood by neighborhood perspective. So, like, in the context of what is happening today in the barrier, you know, if we expect to have two million more people here by 2040, um, obviously we need to increase the housing stock regionally. But if that housing stock is disproportionately built in um, like different generally historically marginalized neighborhoods, that could be a signal, like if an individual building shows up, you know, in a particular neighborhood, you know, in Oakland, for example, that would serve as a signal to other investors that this is, you know, now the time to turn on all the like it's safe to invest here and you can go and put your capital here and that would have a lot of effects on a block by block basis um, on real estate here. So there's like different effects that happen at different levels. Uh, I mean, I think it's a complicated conversation. I mean, basically what I'm frustrated with from a local local planning perspective is this that dynamic that I was pointing to um, in one of the slides, which is like, a lot of more affluent communities are basically not taking any responsibility for um, a lot of the office growth that they have approved. And I don't know what the mechanic is or what the ability is to get them to take more responsibility from that other than having this conversation about regional versus local control. I don't know if that answers your question. One thing to keep in mind is that there's a difference between decentralization and what's sometimes called devolution of power I guess I would say like like in so in San Francisco, like if you take if you look at San Cla Santa Clara County versus San Francisco, in San Francisco you've got tons of different kinds of neighborhoods, and they all have to sit at the same table in one government body and deal with their shit. Whereas in Santa Clara County you've got like these communities making their own decisions and like having no awareness of the impact of their decisions on other communities. And I think just having people at the same table, you know, hopefully designed in a way that represents all these different physical parts, enables people to deal and come to terms with those issues, those regional issues 
at one, in one setting, in one conversation. So we have five minutes left. Yeah. Another way to, to reconcile listening to the paradox is that the idea of you know, increasing where democracy is that you want to get input from everyone that's affected by a decision. And the way that that looks, so if you propose, you know, building 50 units in what is now a parking lot, the future residents are impacted by that decision. But what local control looks like today, local control would mean that the immediate neighbors would have 90% of the power over whether that decision is made. Centralized control, I mean, there's really no way that the future residents have input. And so when you centralize control, the centralized government acts as a proxy for the future residents. So that's how you can make reference out of social. Uh, I think that's a really good point. Um, and about uh, on the issue of decentralization and devolution, I, like I, I'm not, I can't say for sure whether I think the situation of planning right now is really awful, and that NIMBYs come out and protest everything. And one solution that I would said is that centralize the authority for that at the state level. But what I want people to also recognize is that part of that problem might have already been caused by the centralization of tax power at the state level. Yeah. Whereas you were you mentioning that um, housing approvals are revenue neutral because that's the way that property can be structured. So well, they're not. Yeah, they're not really revenue. I mean, unless you unless you get above like forty units an acre, it's actually revenue negative. Yeah. So revenue mm -hmm. revenue right, 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 negative is even worse. So um, part of the solution to this might be. We have to, as you said, rethink Prop 15 and say, well, if you if you let, let a, a land tax be applied on the value of this on, on property as an upsound, then the local community actually benefits in major ways. Like now, there's revenue to build more schools. So, like, I, I, I don't support Mindy's or anything, but it's also I don't like it when people just disregard all of their complaints because, like in, in Portland, um, people, my parents are in because they they object to new housing and everything, but the schools really are stressed there. And like when I went to the uh, in public school in Portland, there weren't even enough chairs for that. So um, like the, the the one way to sort of tie, okay, well we can get more public services, we can get more public revenue with the upsounding is also rethink the concentration of tax authority that's already been removed from local governments. Yeah. Do we have any more questions? Or? I think we're ready. Oh, one more. Okay. Just what kind of solutions do you see? I mean, we obviously have a very good handle on the problem, which I honestly uh, haven't seen from anybody else in the Bay Area other than you. Um, and, and why haven't you been cognitively captured by some of the special interests that have caused these? Uh, I mean, there's a lot of different special interests. There's a lot. Yeah, there's, I mean, I, I mean, I'm, I'm sure we're all captured in some ways, I mean, based on our own upbringings and backgrounds and like what we're exposed to. So I would, I would not say that I'm, you know, I don't know. <laughs> like there's, there's biases that we constantly need to check. Where did your impartiality come from? What's your background? I, I give you my background, I'm from here. I'm from, I'm from the Bay Area. No, I mean, who are you affiliated with? I mean, I, I, well, I mean, I have a lot, like I'm a tenant, so that's one identity group. Um, you know, I'm, I'm like half Asian American, half white. That is one identity group. I grew up in a suburb. Um, my parents were immigrants. My grandparents were immigrants. I'm, you know, like I am exposed a lot to the tech industry, but I have a lot of conversations with people from a lot of different income and um, socioeconomic backgrounds. So I don't know. I mean, I don't know. That's a, I don't know if I'm impartial, really, but yeah. All right. Anyone else?